Live tonight from the virtual circuit, Jill Villeneuve, we say bonsoir et bienvenue à la course 4 for round four of the 2021 Real Sim Racing IRAPS Winter Series. From north of the border in Montreal, Quebec, we welcome you to RaceBot TV's coverage of the McCody Setup Shop 108. Fourth different race of this season, fourth different type of racetrack. For the first time this year, we go road racing, and we're happy that you're with us as always here on RaceBot TV. Jonathan Burke alongside myself, Evan Pasoko with our producer Hugh Luis downstairs, and Dylan Coyle as our RaceBot TV in-race reporter once more. And we talked about this, Jonathan, right through the first couple of weeks. Very different ovals. Well, we're making a bit of a throwback trip, if you would, in these Xfinity Series cars to a track that we've actually never been to before in this winter series headed up to Montreal. It's a very unique track, a very different track when you consider a lot of the road races the Xfinity cars have been to. Last time that we, this series was road racing was all the way back at Mid-Ohio, which is a very different track compared to Canada. This track has 14 corners. Last time the NASCAR series was here was all the way back, I think, in 08. So it's it's been a very long time for the cars as well. It should be very interesting and fun, though. And that's why we thank our friends over at Makoni Setup Shop because the Xfinity Series don't come here anymore, and this is a fixed setup series. Uh, they helped us out building the setup that all the drivers are running on this evening. But let's talk about how we've gotten to this point. I talked about those three very different races that we've seen to open the season, and we've seen three different race winners. Most recently, Matt Danson getting the race win last week. Three different races, three different winners. How Freitage and Danson have been to Victor Lane thus far. Tonight, first of two trips to road courses this year. Uh, we'll be back at the Indianapolis road course, second week of January for round number eight. But points-wise, coming into this, Andrew Freitage's advantage at the top of the championship, despite a loss, did grow a little bit. But Danson, Cato, you got all these other drivers, Dominic Cow, so your three race winners in those top three positions, Jonathan, we could be in store for a great championship battle. And we heard it from Danson last week, right? The fact that maybe we didn't mention him as a championship contender in those first couple of weeks. He used that as motivation. Now he needs to take a race win from last week and turn it into some momentum to not let that 88 car get too far away. Yeah, and this is going to be key. We've doubled the amount of road races from last season to this season. So success here and a solid finish it is going to be key for anyone to keep in touch with Andrew Freenosh. He is the last road winner. He did win at the Mid-Ohio Sports Complex last year. So it's going to be all about making sure you minimize your damage to that 88 car. If the 88 car is the one to beat tonight, the 88 may struggle. Who knows? It'll be interesting. Another thing that is a rule modification from our oval racing to our road course racing is there are no full course cautions. So we could wad up all 30 some odd cars in the field here tonight and they would have to figure out how to make it work. Strategy wise, we're looking at about a one stop race. There's a bit of variance in when these drivers want to take that pit stop at about halfway home. But tonight's race 40 laps long is 108.4 miles total time uh, around this 2.7 to 1 mile road course. 13 to 14 corners, depending on who you ask uh, to get around this place. And it really does feel, you know, it, it, it essentially, right, feels like it's a, a street circuit. And there's a lot of those parts of the racetrack where it is very thin. There is limited runoff. Of course, this track's really known for being an F1 circuit, right? But the Xfinity Series at the time, the Nationwide Series, as you mentioned, did race here some more than 10 years ago. So it's not unprecedented to have these cars here, but certainly this version of the Xfinity Series car hasn't been here. And, you know, when we go to places like Mid-Ohio, even when we go to the Indianapolis Road Course later this year, those are racetracks that I think these guys may have driven a couple of laps around in these cars, right? I don't think many, maybe one or two tops. I don't think many drivers have done laps in these cars at this track up until they knew it was on the schedule this year. Now, it's a track you don't see often or at all in any of the scheduling. And it's a track that I've seen added in a few series just to get a little more variance, a little bit different things in there. I know it seems like there's a big push right now for some road racing action in some of the NASCAR calendars and leaks, as you see Sam Neto getting a little bit wrong there, but this track is very unique and very different to, say, Mid-Ohio and where we were running. You mentioned it, it is kind of like a street circuit, but it's almost that classic Grand Prix-style racing that we're 
talking about. Very thin, thin margin of error. It's not what these guys are used to, so they're going to have to take a lot of time getting used to each other on the track, because they may also not have driven this track when there's 30 some odd cars there. Yeah, a lot of S-sections as well, right? Basically, you got the left-hander and the right-hander for 1 and 2. Same thing at 3 and 4. Same for 6 and 7. Same for 8, 9, and then 13 and 14, right? There's a lot of those areas on the racetrack. It's also a track that has a lot of straightaways. Nieto is not getting a lap time, and there's only about 5 seconds left on the clock. But just to kind of walk you around the racetrack, here is down in 8, 9. Then he heads down to the hairpin. We'll have plenty of opportunities to check in, as this race may become a fight for survival. Survival. First time for a lot of these drivers on a good course in these Xfinity Series cars since last year's Winter Series. We're ready to do it here for 2021. Let's go trackside and take a look at your IRAP starting grid. And it is Matt Danson on pole by nine tenths of a second. Better than the defending road race winner and Andrew Furinage. Michael Araya, Agno Phillip going to make road two. They'll start third and fourth position. And Daniel Eberhardt in the top five. Joseph Tice, Liam Sheen, and Kyle Trudell through the top eight spots. And back on row five, it's Jaron Winemaster and Kyle Kamer. Reese Lechinsky in the 03 and Joe Berge in the four. Line up 11th and 12th. They're hoping for some good results here. Bra Braxton DeWeese and Bobby Krug. Krug finished towards the end of the field last time, hoping for a good road result. David Washington and James Ross, 15 and 16. Looking back, Gary Weaver, highest he started so far this season in 17th. 18th for Nick Mara, Dominic Cow is in 19th, and Shin Kylist in 20th. And that was the last driver to take a time in qualifying. So the rest are provisionals to John Ellenberg, Dylan Jones, Brian Chambliss, Sam Nieto, and Ross Cato, your top 25. And then it is Dylan R. Coyle, Michael Mosier, Michael Kuczynski, Matthew Mara, and Steve Soa through the number 30 spot. So a little bit of a smaller field may allow these drivers to get a bit more space. There's your onboard looks. We'll be checking in with these drivers all night long. And tonight they're going to be getting in a lot of work. I promise you that. They're going to be busy trying to get these uh, Xfinity Series cars treacherously around this circuit, Gilles Villeneuve. And, you know, I mentioned that it may be a battle of survival. We were talking about this pre-race, Jonathan. 40 laps is no slouch either. You do need to be consistent. We'll also be in fast to make it to the end of this race, especially when we talked about how thin the margins are here and one mistake could derail your whole race. And I, I don't know if you noticed this, but I did want to point it out when you're talking about the, uh, the track information. The track is about 96 degrees, and these tires are going to go away. They're going to have a bit of grip issues, so maybe different strategy is going to be kind of tough on them. Base car off it in. We're happy to have you with us, as always, for a Monday night on Race Spot TV. The field in the hands of Matt Danson. He wants a second straight win. As we say, let's go racing from Montreal, the first road race of the 2021 Winter Series. Couple of bobbles through the first set of quarters, but clean so far. And at the front of the field, Andrew Fredinaj to the lead. Dylan Jones is off track, back in traffic. Your race leaders, though, keeping it on track. And again, that 88 car to the point in this first set of quarters. It's a brilliant start from him going down into the center. S is out breaking Matt Danson, but. Again, we saw the qualifying time from Dance, and I'm a little bit impressed. And if I'm free notch, I'm going to be looking in that mirror every single corner. Oh, and a spin. That's Agno Phillip, the 94. He gets turned off track. I think that's turns eight and nine. One of the top five cars in practice and in qualifying. And he has to wait for the entire field to pass to rejoin the track. So Agno Phillip with issues on the opening lap of this race. And that was totally unassisted. Too hard onto the brakes. Let's watch. And a I thought bit that of maybe he would have well. gotten some help from behind. I thought maybe he would have gotten those left side tires in the grass, right? But I don't know if it's just he overdrove the corner and missed his breaking point, or he felt like the guys up the road did. 
But that's all on his own. An impressive job not to take out Lariah, I believe, who was in front of him. But one of the best cars in the field out on his own at the end of the opening lap of this race. Look at this scrap now. On the lap number two, this group led by Joseph Tice. He overcooks it into turn number one. That's going to be Liam Sheen on the bumper. They fight for fourth, fifth, and sixth. Side by side behind them between Trudell and Kamer. Everhart got overtaken by both of them, and now here comes Kamer. A little bit of contact, Everhart goes off. It's so tricky in these S sections. There's so little margin for error right now. Right here as well, blind corner. The car wants to swing out to the left, but you got to get right back over to the right-hand side to get through nine to set yourself up for eight. And again, Everhart smoking the tires. A little bit of a lock up there, hard onto the brakes. Everhart totally missed turn one on his first lap in qualifying. They get two laps, two attempts, and his first one was immediately thrown out the window after he went into the tires. So his qualifying effort of P5 had to come in the second lap, and he had to have known but he had to take it, I think, a little bit easy on that lap because if you don't get any queue time, it would be a mess, I think, trying to get through the field, having started, which would have put him probably 21st or so on the grid. So curious if he has more than top five speed, if that was a bit of a tiptoe lap just to get a time on the board and get a good spot. You can see this mid-pack area is where things are not going to spread out. That's the hairpin down there. And then the longest straight, the casino straight, all the way, that little bit of a right-hand kink there counts as turn 12, and then he'll get into the wall of champions for 13 and 14 and back to the start-finish line. And this is going to be a big overtaking zone as well. They had long straight with the draft. And you can see Eberhardt almost getting into the wall of champions there. Eberhardt is struggling. He's got now Kamer looking to the inside, going into the center. This is... You can see Kamer working hard. He is sweating, and he's using that sequential shifter. So I think he's actually having to go down and shift. You can see the paddles on the wheel right side by side there behind between Eberhardt and the 7 of Trudell. But he did not take the easy way out. He is using the six speed. So he's got to take the hand off the wheel. Every time he wants to upshift and downshift, you can see slotting ahead of the seven to Trudell there was Jared Winemaster, who started in ninth position. Make him plus one as he goes up to position number eight and one of the best parts of the racetrack. I know it's it's tight and there's very little room for error. And you can see the Donnie again, Everhart, too hard on the brakes. Putting down a good lap here is one thing but putting down 40 good laps consecutively is another, and that consistency is what I think these drivers are gonna have to really struggle for and search for. Even just making sure you don't overcook the tires, I think that's where Eberhard is struggling. Those tires are already overcooked, and he's still got another 15, 16 or so laps before he can pit and get them off, but right now he's been dropping. He was in fourth position now. Eberhard is looking to barely hang on to the top 10. You can see the O3 machine back there trying to challenge. Oh, no. oh and there's going to be contact, and Lashinsky gets turned. The 51 going to sneak on through, but Lashinsky checked up, I think, a little bit because Trudell was there, and then he got helped out by the four. You can see Joe Burgi there getting into the right recorder panel, but I'm not sure that Burgi didn't get hit himself by Braxton DeWeese. So they all kind of stacked up on each other in the hairpin. Not the first time you've seen a, a Red Bull car and a hairpin turning someone, but yeah, they all get stacked up as the 7 is looking to go inside of Eberhardt. They both try and leave each other room, but that just creates a little bit of chaos right behind. The tough break for Lischinski at the uh, moment of contact. He was scored back in position number 10. He falls to 14th as of that time by the start-finish line. So now the next battle, Daniel Eberhardt in 8th position. Up the road, you got Kyle Trudell. Um, so these two battles uh, right now for eighth and ninth position on the racetrack. But now maybe for the first time, cars inside of the top 10 with a bit of breathing space, right? They've, they've been able to get some room. I see more tire smoke. That's the 48 of uh, Winemaster, I think, who went way too hot into six and went wide. And now there's a car in defense. It's Liam Sheen. Liam Sheen was fifth last time by and on his own he is into the fence let's see what happened just a little bit too oh. far out on the grass and right into the guardrail and Kamer whew, that was a fantastic job by Kyle Kamer not to ram into the 34. he was fine on the curves but the curbs 
there's like a dead end, right? They don't slowly blend back into the racing line. He just run at a curb and he just got the right rear on it when he was putting the power down and immediately spun the tires. And again, there's no way you save that car and Liam Sheen from the top five spot. He's now found himself all the way down in P9, and I would be concerned about the front end damage maybe wreaking havoc on some engine temperatures and worried about the reliability of that engine through the rest of this race. No quick repairs, so if he decides to stay in pit road a little bit at the pit stop near halfway, he'd have to sit there to get it fixed. Let's go on board with Joe Burgi. He rides right now in the number 11 position. He's got a challenge from behind with David Washington, and let's take a lap around Montreal on board with the four car. virtual circuit Joe Villeneuve and that what a battle that entire lap between Burgi and Washington Washington fenced it in sector two there and then tried to come back at him in the hairpin nearly split it out uh, Burgi you can already see the battle scars we saw some of the contact a little bit earlier in this race and seems like it's not hard to find a bit of trouble as these drivers really pushing the envelope but he did look relatively calm. I think some of the other onboards we've seen with some of these guys are sweating. You see the eyes darting around. I think Burgi has a comfortable pace that he wants to run. Look out the back. That's Washington again. Same spot on track where he got loose last lap that allowed Burgi to overtake him. And again, he's slipping an arm oh, speed no. behind. That is Leschinski, who was turned around earlier just a couple laps ago. Look out. Okano is in the wall trying to avoid him. And I think this was a single car spin. Yes, it was. It's a terrible place to be stuck to. And he's going to back out right into the racing line. And there's nowhere for really Ross Cater to go. Just panics and oof, lucky to uh, escape with just a wall scratch. And it's yeah, a blind it corner. Well, yeah, let's and check Dylan in. was in view of which. this. With our, with our <laughs> race bot TV in race supporter, we haven't bothered him yet to... There's a great battle. Oh, and David Washington's going to turn the 51 of Bobby Krug. So those two drivers got together. Washington got a little bit loose. Krug kind of dive-bombed him a little bit. 98 finished him off there. So Krug drops back a couple of spots. Like I said, it's not hard uh, to find some issues. But Dylan, you started uh, this race in position number 26. You're up to P17. So how's it driving thus far? I'll tell you right after I get through this turn. <laughs> He's got Kato, right? Oh, well. There you go. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And then Ross is having a little bit of a move. Whenever we have a quarter coming up, I'm going to have to possibly shut up because the concentration is a lot here. 
And you can see as well, this is something that we were talking about pre-race with Dylan. You can notice he's got the formula style wheel on it. So I mentioned that, you know, we saw Kamer actually using the H pattern shifter instead of his paddles. Uh, Dylan has gone all in on trying to maximize speed with the road racing setup. And he's going to make a pass on Cato, who's spinning behind. Cato locks up the brakes. Agno Phillip is there as well, who has to go wide to avoid. No front end on uh, Phillip's car after he was in the fence early in this race. And I don't think you can go a lap around here without something scaring you. I may have pushed or forced my way through there, but side by side and uh, was one in my position. <laughs> Another position up by my count. That looks like plus 12. Ooh, but I ain't going through grass. for you. There, see, you start talking, and, and then you miss the quarter. So yep. <laughs> we'll, let you, we'll let you get back to it. Let's check in with your race leaders. We haven't talked much about them off of the start, but we did say that Andrew Farinaj took the race lead away from Matt Danson on the opening lap of this race. Well, Danson has not dropped back again. He out-qualified Farinaj by nearly an entire second. That's normally the interval that Farinaj puts on the other drivers. And of course, we mentioned Danson, race winner, last Monday night at Michigan International Speedway, only a handful of points out of the championship lead, wants to be that driver to beat Andrew Farinaj and snap his championship streak. And he's doing a good job here of challenging and pressuring him for the lead as your leaders have finally cut up to some uh, maybe traffic coming up sh shortly uh, with some of the damaged cars up the road. Yeah, the gap was almost a second uh, for the Freenaj, but Danson has found speed in the first and third sectors, and now he's looking to the inside. Flash in the nose, but I don't think that's a corner that he wants to commit to it on. And, and again, just keep the pressure on, right? And, and it's going to be very difficult to, to force an Andrew Freenaj into a mistake, right? That's... Uh, it rarely happens, if ever. Uh, you can see Steve Soa, the lap traffic up the road, running in the number 26 spot. He'll just go wide uh, and allow your race leaders to cycle on through. And there's P3, not that far back, the 44 of Michael Araya. Uh, but Dan said making uh, a compelling case uh, that this will be uh, a two-horse race for the win. And I just wanted to mention as well a little bit of a different look for Andrew Farinaj tonight. He's got uh, IRAPS on board, that number 88 Chevrolet. So uh, our friends over at IRAPS, not only uh, the title sponsor of this series, and by the way, their, their new website is live, and there's tons of different paint schemes you can pick from to get one customized for your iRacing ride. So go to IRAPS.shop for more info. But they're also now sponsoring the 88 of Farina. She's got the IRAPS colors on board. Is Danson, I wonder if he's worried at all as far as, you know, does Danson really feel like he needs to make the move now, or is he just kind of biding his time, which is normally what we talk about in reference to the 88 car when he's chasing somebody down for the race lead? Because, you know, all week long in practice, um, even tonight in the practice session, Freenage was best, but then in Danson uh, bested him in Q, and there's a bit of an incident back in the back with Dylan Jones locking it up and spinning it out. That's down in the hairpin. Yeah, but to get back to your point, I think Danson is just flashing the bumper, just trying to put Freenaj, you know, in a position where he has to keep looking in his mirror. He has to, you know, keep being aware of where Danson is. You don't want him to get too far ahead. This reminds me of, like, the 2009 uh, Canada GP where Hamilton and Vettel were going back and forth, and they were one and two until there was a controversial penalty at the end. But I think Danson just wants to keep the pressure on and wants to really wait until we get to pit stops, I think, before committing for a move. A bit wide there for Farinaj, though. It'll open up the door for the 50 car at Danson, but not enough. Does he have a run to try to use the, the you know, draft down this long casino straight? He's going to end up about three car lengths off of the bumper of the 88 machine, um, so it will not happen. And uh, since we last checked in, there's Lorai in the background, P3. The difference between them has gone from three seconds uh, to four and change, so your leaders are about... Uh, anywhere from three to five tenths of a second faster than the next fastest cars on track. So uh, it looks like a heavyweight fight between these two that's likely to continue all races. We're working lap number 10, quarter distance. Danson really driving it in hard there in one. Yeah, I think I've noticed something this past few laps, and that's Danson is a little more aggressive on the ends of the corners, and Freenage tends to be a little more aggressive out. These are equal setups. It is a fixed setup race. So this is just a battle of two different driving styles, really, and two different ways to attack the track. And you mentioned him getting wide in the hairpin. 
I think that's just Free Naj's line. He's getting wide, trying to get a good run into 11 and maximize exit speed. And Danson obviously tried to make the inside work, maybe adjust his line off of that corner, kind of work with what Free Naj has given you and find a hole, if you will, in the armor. But I mean, so far, they are just lockstep with each other through the first quarter of this Makoni setup shop 108. And they'll deal with more and more traffic as the race goes on. We saw them catch Soa in the hairpin up the road, Michael Kaczynski, Michael Moser. So a uh, hit for the cars up the road. In most situations, those lapped cars are going to do everything they can to get out of the way. But right here, when you got a couple of them there as Moser goes wide, eventually you will get stuck. And is that where Danson rolls the dice to try to take advantage of that? Or are they just going to be extra careful and maybe it gets decided on a split call with pitch strategy? We were talking about that a little bit earlier tonight that maybe they're in about the 25 lap window on fuel. So it doesn't give a huge window, Jonathan, strategy wise, but it, at least it's not, you know, everyone's going to pit at 20 and that's it. You may see some drivers try to go a bit longer. You can't. Uh, use the the tried and tested nascar method of staying out and hoping for a yellow because again these road course races in real sim racing are caution free no matter what happens but there is a little bit of variance these drivers can go on but uh it's pretty unanimous i would think that it would be a one-stop race yeah pretty unanimous but what time do you go i've noticed at least for the leaders i've had almost a five second drop off in some of their fastest lap both free nosh and dancing had we're in the 140.8 and now they're up in the 145 so they may want to try and pit later just kind of rip the band-aid off of this stint and deal with the slow lap times and try and maximize the fast times uh with the fresh rubber later on in the race but that's something i think that's unanimous across the field this tire grip the tire wear it's going away quickly he talked about those temps right right off at the beginning which isn't going to help either that it's only 69 degrees but track temp 91 degrees so that obviously is going to aid that tire degradation and you know sliding it around we talked about uh, you know kind of how loose this fixed setup is as far as trying to get the power down off of the corner you saw guys like sheen push it a little bit too hard and get off it into the grass as chainless is going to go wide and allow your race leaders to sneak on through and into uh, the hairpin in this one so all of those are factors that these guys are, are working with and I feel good now because just think they've been out there for 11 laps now. We're talking about how old their tires are. Their laps now are what my fastest laps were yesterday uh, in practice, just doing some laps and trying to figure out the track. I, I couldn't get much better than a very high 144.9, and that was you know, my, my pushing it for one lap. So just goes to show you, I was on the same setup as them. Um, you know, how much, how much, even though it's a fixed setup series, right, and, and you would in theory think that everyone's going to be awfully close together, at a road course especially, how much the driver can make a difference when you know what you're doing. Yeah, and even just driving style as well. We've seen almost two different lines from the 05 and the 88. So just managing which way you go, managing how you move. So these two get to go at it, I have a feeling, basically all night long. And, and you can see now an issue up the road that is Matt Mara, who pulls over. He was actually off, off track just in front of your race leaders. He had a spin a couple of quarters ahead of those leaders. I thought that he was just pulling way out of the way, but uh, it was an issue for the driver of the 23 machine. So that's why he was slow and allowed those cars to get on by. There's a look right-hand side of your screen with the 51 car of Bobby Krug, who got turned by David Washington last time those cars were together. Krug drove it apart on the inside. They made contact right where your race leaders are on track right now on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, but it's going to be a position lost in all of this for Krug as Agnel Phillip is being a trooper right now, working through the field without bumper. Uh, after that early race incident, and now we're taking a look on board and in the sim race with the 51 machine crew. No fire suit tonight also, I wanted to mention. I think he's normally in the fire suit, but he's uh, designed for comfort here tonight at the road course, knowing that this one's going to be a lot of hard work. I think just when you're just out of your element, I think you just want to be in a nice, comfortable position. I think that's where Krug really is. He, he, I think he kind of let Angle Phillip go just because he knows that 94 has been faster, so just running his own race, running his own line, just trying to survive. Daniel Phillip, based on lap times, um, could possibly get a top 10 in this race still, despite the fact that, of course, he had that big off on the opening lap of this race. And 
obviously that's the worst time to have an issue because if you spun now and lost five seconds, depending on where you are in the field, you might only lose six spots. But on the opening lap of this race, he basically went all the way to the end of the running order, having to allow all the lead lap cars to go on by uh, before he then pulled back on track. So it was very courteous. Bobby Krug uh, has some left front damage you can see there. So he's had some contact at some point this evening. Started exactly where he runs right now. 14th position right in the mid pack. There's only 21 of the 30 cars who started this race still on the lead lap. And a handful of cars have gone to the garage. Steve Soa is in the garage. His night is done. Sam Nieto was having connection issues all night. His night also has ended early. And now Daniel Eberhardt out of this race after running in position eight. So did Eberhardt have another incident? I think he just had another spin in turn number one, ended up into the tires and uh, in, in a bit of uh, maybe red mist, parked it. So Eberhardt done. He came into tonight fifth in the championship. Yeah, it was not running well. It looks like this is the replay of it. He gets it a little on the curb in one, and then, wow, apparently there's a portal on the exit of turn one. <laughs> I think that's the that's the red miss, the alt F4, the I'm done with this. I think that's the sim racing equivalency to popping the wheel off and throwing it out the window. Or like he could have, he could be in Narnia. We we really don't know. Like that 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 seemed like a teleportation <laughs> almost. So he gives up what was a top ten position. Granted, Eberhardt fifth in the championship. Again, he's somebody who went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Farinaj for a Cup Series championship right there with Michael Lariah. Um, you know, Daniel Eberhardt already at a 30-some-odd point deficit in the points. going to be awfully, awfully difficult, even if he, you know, was up there running with these top two tonight. But uh, obviously felt that with that spin, that was going to kick him outside of the top 12 or so. And at that point, with the damage, he feels like uh, that that's pretty much it. Um, so, you know, one of those drivers that comes into the road course races looking to just survive, to not make mistakes, and had struggled with consistency. In the first half of this one, his night is done, so bring everybody else on the lead lap, which was 21 cars. Now it's just 20. Uh, move them all up a position because Daniel Everhart's night has come to an end. In race reporter Dylan Coyle, he's slowly trying to catch the number 12 machine. Those two have been close most of the night. Yeah, uh, you know, I think for me right now, it's just uh, survive until the pit stops because I do not have the same uh, shorter braking distance that I have had um, when I had fresher tops. Yeah, I've kind of, I've noticed this in the lap times. The, the tire drop off is, is really, really huge right now. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's really, it's a struggle out here right now for sure. Well, I'm glad I'm up here. Yeah, um, I wish I was you right now. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Whenever I talk to you guys. Right, well, you can just cool. sign to us um, and, and that'll help out. Tell us about the decision though to change the wheel uh, for this race, obviously, because it's a road course. Um, do you want the, uh, the racer's answer or do you want the truth? Uh, give me both, and it'll decide which one I like better. It takes too much time to uh, screw in the other wheel um, with, you know, one screw, and uh, it's road racing. It's a matter of convenience there, as you can see, and, and we pick up a battle a little bit further up the road. Agano Phillip has gotten around David Washington, so those two drivers exchange 12th and 13th position. Again, Philip is about now eight seconds off of John Ellenberg in 11th, who's been awfully quiet tonight. That would be the next challenge. A top 10, though, may be tough because then you'd have to look all the way up to Braxton DeWeese, who is about 24 seconds up the road of this trio now. And look behind. Here they go. It's Bobby Krug on David Washington. He'll go to the inside, complete the pass. Now a heavy braking zone for turns one and two. And after they touched last time, they had a change for position. It's time to do it cleanly. And Bobby Krug now back to P13. Washington had an amazing save, though. It looked like he was driving with a little bit of corona in his system right there. The car was just all over the place, but still managed to hang on.
You can see the bobble up the road. I mean, Krug, that car getting sideways, but almost as if he was anticipating it to get a little bit out of shape. And he also don't want to get too far left on that left-hand curb that they just went over because there's a lot of body roll as well in these cars. And, and I don't know if it's you know, necessarily a, a tank slapper, if you would, but when you when you have the, the side of the car basically getting hiked up, if you don't let it settle either, I mean, easing into the gas is one thing, but if you don't allow the car to settle, in those parts of the racetrack as well. That's how you can end up all over the road. Yeah, you kind of want to take it like a GT3 style car. You know, you can still attack the curb and do decently well as they're looking at a replay of this amazing save by David Washington over correcting. But you can take a little bit of curb here and be okay. You just don't want to take too much, have the wheels come up in the air and then come back down and lose control of your car. I think that bobble was in 14, I think, coming right by the start finish line. So that's either what opened up the door um, for the pass to happen for Bobby Krug. But I don't think Krug's just going to stroll away. Now we're back on the board with Washington. A lot of curb there for the 51. And you can see just hanging the back end out. But he does get a better corner exit. But if you want to drive these cars hard, you can. And there's time in that if you're willing to hang it out like that every single lap. We've seen other drivers be much more kind of smooth operator approach, not want to get a lot of curb. And somebody like Bobby Krug, obviously comfortable with using every inch of the racetrack. He's basically on the curbs into the corner and off of each corner. And again, you don't want to get that car off into the grass. We saw what happened um, earlier in this race with, uh, you know, some guys. And there's Washington. Oh, he'll spin. Washington into the wall as we rode on board. He was 14th on track. Nieto going to make a pass. Yeah, and I'm right behind him, so we'll see what this is like. <laughs> he might be seeing some red right now, too. Had a rough night. There's a quite beat up number 98 machine. And again, I talk about the curbs. That was just all on his own. I think that was down in three and four. And there, obviously there was no challenge from behind, but I think he just got a little bit too far over those curbs, almost to the point where those left sides might have even been on the grass, totally over the curbs, and got himself loose. And fortunately, now that we're spread out, when you have a car sideways like that around a blind corner, you don't have the incidents like we saw earlier in this race where somebody like a Nieto basically had to fence themselves to avoid a car stop sideways on track. No, but always you got to look at your, your relatives. Sometimes you get in that rhythm of you're driving by yourself, you're not paying attention, and all of a sudden you turn in the corner, there's a car sideways. So it's just coming down to you know, or making you're sure you have a good uh, Or you're listening to the broadcast. <laughs> or or, or trying you're trying to, to do talk both. Us through a lap. I, I, oh, oh, now you want me to? <laughs> no, I'm just... You can, you can walk us through a lap whenever you want, but we are starting to get to See, the point I where get. pit stops may be a possibility. I'm not even missing, I haven't missed a single corner when I'm not talking to you guys. I think it's because I'm holding down the push to talk button. Can you change that automatically for me? <laughs> I don't know if we have the technology to do it uh, Unfortunate. from here. So you'll just have, the good news is I will tell you uh, that this will be another point in favor of Wawa for the Wawa Sheets battle. Uh, because it was three, two, one? To one, two to one for you going into tonight. But Steve Soa is out of this race after having uh, an incident back on lap number nine. I almost just um, went out of this race, too. <laughs> back on lap nine when he had an issue um, at the Wall of Champions and, and decided to park the car after several instances before. So even if the night doesn't end where you sit now, which I will say again, an impressive plus 10 up to P16, um, it'll be three to one in your favor for, for at least that tally coming out of this race. We love to hear that, and uh, yeah, I don't think you're going to be getting in on board uh, with me giving a description of an entire lap. It's just not possible here for me. Look at this. I'm, I'm struggling here holding my uh, thumb. My left thumb is on uh, one of the top buttons, and it's tough. Well, I mentioned maybe a possibility of pit stops coming up. Jonathan, we have a whole slew of cars in right now at lap number 18. Yeah, I wanted to ask you the, the question, Evan, what, what would be better for these drivers to get to come in and get the fresh arbor as soon as possible or to just wait it out and wait a little bit longer? Because now Kama's going to have to do 22 laps on those tires. And he's already uh, he was already struggling a bit on eight. He was in fourth position, but he's struggling a bit on 18. 
Yeah, I would almost at this point just go right to the midway point, right? I, I mean, there is a significant undercut for the cars at the back of the field. The fall off is anywhere from three seconds to, to five or six seconds, right? It depends on, you know, what kind of hot lap you got in in the opening couple of laps of this race. For the leaders, though, we know it's it's pretty much five, right? Danson, Ferninage, all those guys pretty consistently running 145s when their best were 140s. So for them, there is certainly an advantage to the undercut. I think mid-pack, though, when you're looking at, you know, between some spots closer to 10 seconds or so that you might just want to split it in half, right, and, and play it smarter. Or if you feel good on the tires now, go a little bit longer, right? I mean, that undercut is certainly there. Um, but Danson also is on pit road. So here you go. I was just about to say Danson may have been somebody to take advantage. He pits from second position and Michael Loria pits from third. So both cars behind Farinaj in at lap 19. It's not a surprise, though, with Loria. He usually loves the undercut. But I think they had to take it. Danson had a four-second gap to Freenage. It was under a second. We were watching them, but when we went away, Danson kind of dropped off the back of Freenage. This is something that he needs to do. He needs a fantastic outlap to really close the gap to the 88. They are going to blend back out onto the racetrack right now, and you can see that's the 05 machine. Is uh, That was Chambliss, I think, getting way out of the way. Danson rejoins the track. Um, he has fallen to position number four right now. His pit Time was 43 seconds, uh, 15 seconds in the stall itself for four tires and fuel. And now he is good to go the distance. But this right here is hurting him, right? Oh, the seven car! Kyle Trudell from fourth just wrecked. He has not yet come down to pit road. And I think was feeling the pressure by Danson rushing through on fresh tires. I don't think he helped him, though. I think that was Trudell on his own. Yeah, I think he was just watching the mirror and not paying attention. But now here comes Freenage. He has to come down pit road. I can see yeah, maybe a little, maybe like a slight nudge. But I don't think it was enough to send him around like that. I think Trudell was already kind of losing it. Yeah, I think if they touched, it would have been after he already gotten sideways. So I was about to say, this is not what Danson wants, right? He wants clean track to be able to get a hot lap in now to make up, as you mentioned, that about four second deficit that he had to Ferninage when they pitted. But Ferninage is in pit road getting service now. Right side's already complete. They're gonna go over to the left-hand side of the car and he is gonna get his four tires. We'll be able to see Danson come down that front straightaway. There, there he is, is left-hand side of your screen, but he's gotta go through the S here. Ferninage is gonna skip these first two corners he's going to come on the outside of turn number two and they're going to be side by side for the lead matt danson the one lap undercut takes the lead from andrew fridaj can the 05 though make this last he fell way back in the closing few laps of this run but he was good early can he hold off the 88? Or does Ferdinand feel like he'll still be better in 15 laps later in this run like he was on the last? And will Danson struggle in the last five laps of this race? At least for this moment, though. Halfway next time by, the undercut did its job. Yeah, even with that spinning car right next to him, Danson put in an impressive second sector yeah, to really close the gap. Yeah, probably would have been more if he didn't end up behind those two guys because it wasn't just that one corner. That probably held him up for at least two or three. Oh, yeah, that was, that was difficult. And he doesn't have, like, a an entire Formula One crew box telling him where his delta is. He just came out in traffic at the wrong instant as Freenosh deep under braking, trying to find a way to get around Danson early. I'm in the pits. I have my hands off the wheel for the first time in a while. Um, Does it feel I, good? Yes. It, my hands were literally going numb, but it's about to end. So, bye, guys. <laughs> Four tires in fuel for uh, Dylan, who's back in the number 15 spot at the moment. So, he'll get his service and get off the way. And, oh, look at Farina. She's going to go wide and back to pit road. Did Farina have a penalty, maybe? Andrew Faridaj, who just pitted and had lost the race lead to Danson, has come down pit road. We don't have any official indication to say if he did get penalized. And it's not like he accidentally went into pit road. There looked like a bit of a swerve at the first point, but he definitely did drive it down pit road. He got his four tires. That's not an issue. 
and he's just sitting here. Is this either a time penalty or for some reason did he forget to fuel the car? Yeah, I'm wondering if he did not get enough fuel in there. That that seems to be my guess because you don't see any the, the jacks going up right now in the 88. I mean, he's just sitting there, and and there's so many different penalties. You know, Liam Sheen had said over the radio that he got a speeding penalty. Um, I think if it was just fuel that he had forgotten, he would have been done by now, right? That's, you know, 12, 13 second range to get it full of fuel. So either this is a penalty that Farinaj is serving or just some sort of other issue, right? Could have had an issue with the computer, with the monitor, with something that he had to take care of. He is now back on track, but this is after spending more than a minute on pit road. I'm wondering, on the way out, from pit road, you see that white line and the blue line. That is the pit exit. You're not allowed to cross, cross that white line. I'm wondering if he was so focused on dancing, he crossed over that line. Well, I'm going to go back and take a look and just watch his speed as well, but I don't think the speed was an issue. He left pit road at about 44 miles an hour. Pit road speed here uh, is 40, so that's tight. Could have got a speeding off of pit road because, again, just like we could see dancing coming down, um, the front straightaway, so could he, and I do not see any line infraction on the blend line. Um, to me, it looks totally clean for that, and so I'm What about on the entrance? It has, it, it, let's go back, I'll go back and look at entrance as well. I don't think that it was exit. Um, just checking the, the speed on entry, he looks good. He looks, he looks better speed entry than he does speed exit, so the only thing I can think of is that it would have been a speeding penalty on pit exit seeing dance in there and, and, and trying to stay in front of him. Yeah, we'd have to go back and double check, but that I, I want to say it might be that line penalty. It's a penalty I've gotten an unfortunate number of times uh, you know, going over that line just a little bit. If he crossed it just with two tires, that might have been enough for iRacing to ding him. So it could have been a speeding penalty that derails Andrew Farinage tonight. And this is big because he falls all the way to position number nine. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, where we are in the points and whatnot and, and you know, kind of how this will affect um, the championship as far as, you know, if they finish here, um, you know, kind of where Fridaj can get to on speed because this group of race cars is, is somewhere where he's trying to get right up the road this trio, Braxton DeWeese, Kyle Trudell and Joe Burgess, sixth, seventh, and eighth position, are only about seven seconds up the road. I think that's something that Farinaj can do. But just to talk points and kind of break down what's happened here. Of course, the win for Danson last week put him seven points, or eight points, I should say, off of Andrew Farinaj for the lead in the championship, right? If they finish now... Danson would get max points because he would lead a lap. So I think uh, Washington just spun. Wouldn't be the, uh, that'd be probably the dozenth time that uh, Washington sat an issue, and I think he did. He did spin. Um, I think that was out of three and four. So max points as it stands for Danson. A single bonus point for Faridaj. We could be looking at a near tie for the points. If Farinaj, say, gets one or two more positions in this race, what a contrary to a night in which he could have picked up points after he was looking, Jonathan, at least, to be in the catbird seat approaching that pit cycle. Yeah, he was he was in the catbird seat. He came up behind Danson, but he had slightly fresher tires, and he looked stronger on the long run. So it was Farinaj's race kind of to lose against Matt Danson, but now he's going to have to try and make up time and the problem is also, these guys are racy. <laughs> these guys are not going to be easy to pass. They're not going to be lap cars. They're for a position. So I don't think they're going to pull out of their way for free notch. Yeah, the racing is good because they're slowing each other down right now. So that's going to allow him to catch them. But you're right. Then when he does get there, it's not going to be like what drivers have been doing all night. And that's, you know, pulling literally off of the racing surface to let him by when he's the leader. Um, because it's going to be for position. Looks like uh, Danson dealing with some traffic. I also heard Liam Sheen not very happy over the radio. Liam Sheen has had an issue. I think he may have lost the engine. Yeah, it says Agno Phillips asking him now, now yet. 
and, and he lost the engine. And I said after he nosed that car into the wall that I would be concerned about the front end damage in the engine. It has blown Liam Sheen's night is done from a top 10 spot. Here's the battle for six, though. To the inside is DeWeese in the six car. Outside, that's Kyle Trudell. All these cars going to fight now as they head to the casino straight. It's going to be a big draft for DeWeese. He's going to look to make a big move down to the 13 and 14, but... They're going to have to play the Jaws music. There's a man by the name of Andrew Freenosh who's coming in hot. He's three seconds faster than all three of these cars in this group. Yeah, last time by a second better. And as they battle, you mentioned that goes from one second faster to three. There he is. If he can get all three spots and get to sixth, that may be enough to keep Matt Danson in check as far as trying to take the lead in the championship again there is a big bonus to being the race winning driver in this point structure your race winner walks away with 40 second place walks away with 35 and then it is a single point interval so if he can get these three cars and a p6 would pay out 31 points to farinaj plus a bonus point so he would get 32 Dance and max points would be 42. It would be a 10 point swing, and it would be a two point lead in the championship for Danson. I think at this point in time, that is a best case scenario for Farinaj. Yeah, it's, it, I think the best case is going to be overtaking those cars and hoping not to get involved in those cars because some of them, Trudel, Deweese, and Bergie. Been through the wars a little bit. They've been part of contact, and Freenosh has kept his nose clean. And here's a challenge now to the inside. It's Bergy on the inside of Deweese. Bergy makes the pass, and then he spins. So there is one spot as Bergy gave it too much. He spun coming out of the hairpin, and now Farinaj on the bumper. He wants to challenge it. It already has passed the three of Braxton Deweese. So we talked about how challenging it would be for him to get past those three cars, Jonathan, and two of them made it easy. Well, I mentioned Freenaj just had to stay out of trouble, and, well, trouble found the other two in front of him, but he stayed out of it, and now he can go after the seven and get back up to sixth, and he may have enough pace to get a top five still. And Joey said uh, that's the second time he's run through him today, his words over the radio. I didn't see contact um, with Burgie down in, in the hairpin, but maybe he was assisted on the spin. And in fact, there was assistance. He did get turned by the three of DeWeese. Didn't catch that initially. Thought he just gave it too much because he drove it in so hard into the corner. But the four got loose. The three drove through him. So it uh, wasn't akin to, you know, slamming on the brakes and cutting him a break. So uh, a bit of tough love out there. And that will drop Burgie down. Uh, to position number nine. He doesn't lose anything outside of his group of cars because uh, that group of four was some 20 seconds ahead of the next closest driver. So now Ferdinand sets his sights on Trudell. I just think it's going to be tough to get to P5 here in Winemaster because that's another 18 seconds up the road once you get Deweese. And with 15 laps to go, is it possible? Yeah, he'd only need to be about 1.2 seconds faster, and Ferdinand could possibly be the best car on track. In fact, last lap, he was three-tenths of a second faster than Matt Danson. So I'm not going to rule out a top five, but it's definitely an awfully tall order. It's going to depend with the tire fall-off, too. You know, we still have 15 laps remaining, and since a lot of these guys pitted earlier, the fall-off is going to be a little bit, little bit higher, and you're not going to want to come back down for tires, obviously, because that will lose you even more time. So I think it's it's still possible for him to get the 48. He just needs to you know dispose of the seven as quick as possible. In you know, Master's last lap of 144.4, Farina is just now crossing the start finish line. He'll put down a 143.4. So a second better that lap, not enough. He needs to be a little bit better than that if he wants to make it happen. Uh, but this is Andrew Farina, who had many times um, has looked you know superhuman in some of these races um, and now finds himself on the back foot of a Matt Danson race lead. Danson has been taking it easy, trying to back off and allow some of these lapped cars to get some space as the 05 leads. What a turn of events halfway through this McConey setup shop 108. 
all your cars have been on pit road and are good to the end. So let's enjoy the sights and sounds of Montreal as we go race spot TV fan immersion. And that was on board with the challenger at this point. Michael Lariah now assuming the number two spot didn't get as much of a benefit in the pit cycle as Danson did. Remember, they came down to the pit road together, second and third. Danson leapfrogged Ferdinand to go to the race lead. Lariah basically stayed in third. He's going to have to get around Ross Cato there. That costs him um, some time up the road as uh, that advantage has now gone to six seconds. It was two seconds, one lap. Lariah lost five seconds on that lap alone after he, I think, got a course cut penalty for missing, I think, seven and six. Now, the lap traffic not helping either, as here comes, you know, I, was, I mentioned play the Jaws music. Well, Shark is here, and he is right on the back of Trudell, and this is going to be a big move down to the center S's. Going to go to the left-hand side. It's a tricky place to make a pass, but I have the inside position to forward turn number one, and it will not be a fight from the seven of Trudell. So Farinaj now back into position number six. He can set his sights on Yaron Winemaster, who is some 16 seconds up the road. Can he do that? In about 13 laps of action left here at the virtual circuit, Gilles Villeneuve. It's a tall order. There's cars in the way that he's going to have to deal with, but I will never say that Andrew Farinaj can't do it. Again, I thought this right here, best case scenario, uh, by my math, which to be fair is uh, not necessarily always 100%. It is suspect at times. I would say that Matt Danson, if it finishes as we run now, leaves this race with a two-point lead in the championship. It's probably Sorry, a fantastic I can't do math right now. <laughs> it's, it's I, I was able to feeling. crunch the numbers on the onboard there, so hopefully it's close. You don't know your side fuel calculator and your side points calculator with you at all times? No, see, there's a reason why when, when I drive on the sim, I, uh, you know, do some of the uh, the, the less technically inclined stuff. Uh, you know, I, I don't uh, crew chief for anything. I just ask everybody else when we're pitting and I kind of join in. You should uh, spectate or spectate, um, be a spotter. That's what uh, Jonathan and I sometimes do. <laughs> Speaking of spotting, it's fun to... Joe Berge sending it across the Deweese down in the hairpin. Licking that was the a fantastic stand. move. Well, Deweese is the one who went through him last time in the hairpin, right? He said that was the second time, I think, when that incident happened. We take a second look now on Not going to take prisoners there. Yeah, there with him. He made the pass, and then, and then he really wasn't there, and I think Deweese thought he was getting sent. I think Deweese thought, hey, I ran him over in this same corner three, four laps ago, whatever it was. I think he was scared, to be honest, because he was set up for the corner, and then he just went straight into the runoff. So I, mean, I think uh, I think Burgi threatened him a little bit there and, and didn't make him feel quite safe. If we're being honest, I don't care what car it is. If there is a car behind me or in front of me, I'm scared. 
Gotta be worried when you don't see the cars. It's a tricky track. Uh, working lap number 29 next time by. Going to be 11 laps to go in this race. Again, the battle for the race lead has fallen apart ever since uh, Lariah had, I believe, some sort of a course-cutting slowdown penalty. That took the difference between first and second from two seconds to seven. Uh, you got about 12 seconds between third and fourth, 10 seconds fourth to fifth, 15 seconds uh, from fifth to sixth, which is the difference between Winemaster and Farinaj. Uh, in fact, the closest battle could be uh, between somebody like a Kruger to Kato for 12th and 13th position. Of course, we'll watch all these fights all night long, and you can see Farinaj pulling away from that Sabata Trudel uh, behind him. In fact, there is uh, that, that Burgi and Deweese battle. In fact, some of the best up uh, on track right now is maybe the three trying to come back at the four. They've been equal on pace all night, and they really have not left each other alone. And you would think normally the, uh, the top of the numbers fly at the short tracks, but no, you, in real life NASCAR as well as sim racing, you can see some hot tempers in NASCAR at these road courses. And I think right now they're they're showing a little bit of teeth. They're, they're getting a little angry. Last time by, fastest car on track still, Andrew Farinaj. This time his advantage over Yaron Winemaster. Uh, was 1.6 seconds, so that is a surmountable gap if you can keep that pace all the way through. Once again, though, catch it up with your race leader, the 05 Chevy of Matt Danson. Last week's winner, trying to put it to Andrew Farinaj here on the road course, and I have to say, you know, the drama moment with Farinaj pitting, it's unexpected. I don't think anybody saw that coming, but I feel robbed of what was likely to be an incredible race between those two. Yeah, it was really shaping up to be something incredible, and I think Brinaj being stronger on those later runs was really, really something that we were going to see and how he's going to attack Matt Danson. But now uh, it's kind of just a fight back for Brinaj and see how far he can get and see his hard cards. And then for these, all these midfield cards, it's going to be a fight to see, oh, how much time can you make up and how many points can you make up with some of the big names like Sheen, like Eberhard having issues, and then like, you know, for Tyson Winemaster, if you can hold free notch behind you without any mistakes. And talking about mistakes, you know, for Washington, it's been a rough night. There's another one, a bit of a bobble uh, at a turn number one. That's the thing that I said right off at the top, right? This race is not going to be determined based on who can do the fastest hot lap or, or where you were in qualifying, right? This is a race where you can probably skip Q, and if you've got a 10th fastest car on track, you can probably still finish 10th, right? There's enough time at about race time that will get close to an hour and 15 hour and 20 minutes uh, from green to checkered. That's enough time to kind of balance out, I think, where you deserve. That this race was going to come down to consistency, and David Washington has struggled with that tonight. He's had great laps. His best lap of a 143.3, if you rank the cars by their best lap of the race, he'd be like sixth. And there's another spin now, this time up the road from the eight car. And he's what the next guy. <laughs> I need to pass him. I'm just going to hope that he keeps spinning Put it again. so I don't have to battle with him. Here's the replay of the spin and how close the eight car came of Kyle Kamer. Kamer in third position, by the way. So that was not fourth position there. But then he spun it trying to recover the car. Here's it at full speed. You can see the spin and a good job by Kamer to avoid. And then when he tried to get it back going, he split it again. And that was a free position gained for the number 79 of Dylan Coyle. There it is. Spin it again, trying to get back going. And uh, there's, uh, there's you sneaking through. Yeah. Um, and I know he's faster um, on average. I've been very uh, non-aggressive uh, during this Careful. race. Very concerned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because obviously... It's a difficult track as I bounce over the curbs. I'm talking to you guys. Um, maybe I just am not good. Maybe it's not that I'm talking to you guys. Um, but just if he has the speed, I'll let him go. Top half of the field, I'd call that uh, pretty good right now. Scored 14th of the 30 cars, and, and he'll try to chase you back down. So we'll let you get back to uh, focus in on that as that battle continues. Washington uh, trying to make up for uh, about a difference of two, three seconds or so, I think, out of the back of that battle for 14th and 15th spot. Ross Cato up the road uh, from Dillon is another car for position. He scored in 13th. We are down to 11 cars on the lead lap. Uh, last car on the lead lap right now is Agnel Phillip, who has done his very best 
to try to get back and into a top 10 spot after he had a self spin from P5 on the opening lap of this race. And here's a good battle between these two. Joe Burgi and Braxton DeWeese just cannot get away from each other. And that's when the uh, the tempers start to boil up just a little bit when you're stuck around the same guy all race long. Uh, you get a little bit more agitated every time something happens uh, with that same number. Yeah, these are cars that are often around each other during the roval races as well. So this is something that might even carry on as the season goes on, the three and the four. Uh, yeah, the, they've gotten around each other, but they can't seem to gap each other. And I'm wondering if it's just that, that mentality of viewing it in the mirror and all of a sudden you look behind you and it's, ah, oh, they're still there. i got to be defensive instead of being you know, focus forward and trying to make a best lap. And they're all on their own, so they have this pocket to be able to fight with one another. Um, they are... That's about, the scary part, Evan. Yeah, they're, they're about 12 seconds behind the next closest car. That's Kyle Trudell in seventh. I don't think they're getting there. And they're ah, about David 25, 25 seconds ahead of Agno, Phillip, and John Ellenberg. And oh, oh. he's going to hit somebody else. Washington may have touched Winemaster. The 48 is okay, is he? No. He looks hurt. That car looks like it's crab walking at least a little bit after Washington spun it in 13 and 14 and then pulled right in front of the 48. Uh, you can see the steering struggling. You can see Winemaster struggling in Washington. Now even has more damage on that car and Remember, this is the car that Farinage is chasing. Don't forget, this could be a spot gained for Farinage. We're watching the replay with the Washington. He was on the back bumper there of Dylan Quayle, our in-race reporter, just overcooked it, spun it off to the side, and again, right there. And he tried to stop. Winemaster tried to hop the curbs, but it's that smack into the tires is what's going to have everything out of a line there on the 48 car. Nothing Winemaster could have done, and... Probably an unsafe re-entry for the 98 machine. I know it's a blind corner in any instance, but at least kind of, you know, put look it in neutral, relative. rev it up, and then flip it around. He just kind of pulled right in front of him there. Well, also, look at your relative uh, timing, right? Like, yep. you got to be able also, to see. I mean, important to note as well, you know, when we see incidents on track, normally the point where we talk about incident points and whatnot, because there are no cautions, you can't technically be assigned a penalty point for cause of caution. So in real sim racing, road racing events, it is for every 10 incident points that you accrue in the race that you get a penalty point. And I'm sure David Washington has more than 10 incident points. That could have been four right there for contact. So he will be in a little bit of rough shape, I think, coming out of this race. I've had none for contact, and so far I think nine for off track endeavors. So just don't get any more and you're good to go. Uh, he's just now that you said it, you know you're going to get one more. Shut up. Listen, <laughs> you, let you brought it up. I didn't say you were one away. You're the one that said you're at nine. Yeah, I know. Uh, my mind is... Oh, no. <laughs> I'm stopping the... Ah, I can't even speak. The driver has... Have we ever seen a driver give themselves the commentator's curse? All the time in this race, yes. Every, every time you've talked? <laughs> I'm not doing that bad, and then I speak. I don't know, me, well, I, I was bad during the Ivor uh, doubleheader at Barber. I said a couple few, but uh, here comes Freenage, and again, shark in the water. Winemaster, we know he just hit the wall. He's, he's going to get him. I think this is going to be a top five for sure for Freenage and damage limitation from that earlier issue. Yeah, I, I don't think it's hurting Winemaster much because look at the intervals, right? So three laps ago, Freenage was 2.4 seconds better. The 4.9 is going to be the lap point. at which that contact happened. But then last lap, he was only 1.8 better. So last lap with damage, Winemaster was faster than he was three laps ago on lap number 31. So it, I'm certain it's hurting him. You know, the wheel and the toe is probably a little bit out of the line. But um, I think that at this pace, only with six laps to go, he may have been able to hold Farinage off if he didn't lose those five seconds in that one lap. But now at a point where it seems nearly inevitable as we look from high and above, the difference between those two now down to about a second and change. Six laps to go this time by. It's a battle for P5. Why am I just looking everywhere in his mirror, just making sure Same I can here. take away the line? Oh, uh, yeah, I've noticed you're right in front of this battle, too. So if you see a very uh, blue and angry idiot behind you, I recommend just pulling out of the way. I think that's exactly what Why Master's doing. Those people are trying to try and defend. 
And that's going to be an easy pass. As you fight back, he does. Winemaster going to keep it on the inside of the racetrack. Okay through one. But Fredage set that self up beautifully. And after the penalty, fell down and has now gotten back into the top five position, which again, rough math, probably a one-point difference for the top spot in the championship if it finishes how it runs now through the first four weeks of this 2021 Real Sim Racing IRAPS Winter Series. We talk about Freddie Dodge's dominance, and if you tune into one or two of these races, he's probably up front, you know he's good. But unless you watch RSR a lot with us here on Race Mod, and, and including the last couple of years, he is really, really good. And, and we saw the group challenge by guys like Lariah, like Eberhardt, and at a point we thought it was gonna be a championship for Lariah in the Cup Series until Late Race Yellow came out, right? Sometimes. You're good, and sometimes you're good, and you get the luck on your side. But drivers have been improving. They have significantly closed that gap to Ferdinand in the past. But this is a icebreaker championship, of course, different than Cup, where there is no one race takes it all. It's 10 weeks. Not a lot of drivers, if any, can probably beat Ferdinand straight up on a 10-week championship. He won this series points by more than 100 last year. It was his second straight Winter Series title. His Cup Series championship from this past fall was his third straight Cup Series championship. But we saw new teams join the fray, right? Extreme Performance Motorsports and some of the other teams. Um, you know, the team has joined now in this one. And now Matt Danson driving with Horizon, right? An incredible talent. Already a one-time race winner. If he gets the job done here, would be two wins and four starts with three top ten finishes in that span, Danson doing what Lariah did a couple of years ago when he first joined this past, you know, Cup Series championship in a full campaign as a new face to challenge that hierarchy in which Ferdinand has sat on top of for so long. I think Danson, I think he's proving right here that he is a face to challenge. I think Michael Lariah as well, this winter season is proving that he's still going to be a fight for this championship and he's running in second, but oh boy, we're back to these two and these two just can't seem to get along. They're like two younger siblings. They, they just don't like each other. And awfully close. We're on board with the rear one. That's going to be Braxton DeWeese up the road. The four of Joe Burgi. At least for now, minding their P's and Q's. But see the damage on both those cars? I think almost all of it has come from these two cars getting into each other. So uh, this will be a fun battle to watch. Uh, now in crunch time, this next time by going to be four laps to go in this race. You've made it this far. You would hate to just make a mistake late and, and throw it all away. These cars fighting, um, again, for eighth and ninth on track. This race likely to end with probably nine cars total on the lead lap. I think that Ellenberg and Phillip uh, are likely to get lapped by it's done. And here's the move to the inside by DeWeese. And there's the touch wide on corner exit and push Joe Burgi out of the way this time no comment but I'm sure the four is uh, not happy that was a far back send from the three car of DeWeese he, Daniel Ricardo would be proud lick the stamp and send it he saw a gap took it and just this little contact right there a little bit of a bully move out of the corner yeah I mean he knows what he's doing there right it's not like he can say I just overdrove it into the corner and locked it up. He came from behind, but he didn't miss the corner. He's fine. At this point, he could stay on the inside, but he intentionally tries to keep that car a little bit wide to squeeze the four out, and now there's a touch, and there's the payback. So Burgi was tired of the three car getting into him two times ago. He said it was for the second time, so in his mind, that was at least number three or four, and he moved him in turn one, let's take a second Wine, look. Hey, just to let you know, Wine Master, he just spun off. That'll be from position six for Wine Master. He'll lose the spot to Kyle Trudell. So that'll be a change for six and seven. And there's the contact between our leaders. Yeah, Burke just Those, those top right cars, there. eight to ninth, I should say. Not not one, two, but the, the, that lead lap battle uh, between those two. and. I think that the touch, there's the look with Winemaster down, missing the corner, and that allowed Kyle Trudell uh, to sneak on by. Um, and but Dylan I think the touch, yeah, yep. another spin right in front of you in case you haven't had enough tonight. But, you know, for those two, I think the touch in the carousel or the, the hairpin was intentional, and I think the payback was too. And 
He didn't send him into the fence. Uh, he got moved, so so he moved him back. And, and these two are not done, by the way. Deweese is trying to chase him back down again. He drove it down deep into the hairpin again, did Braxton Deweese, and lost a bit of time. And I think Joe Brady might be able to hold again unless something goes wrong. These two have been really equal on pace. And hopefully they don't cause any more calamity with cars around them. You can see, I believe that's Nick Mara running very slowly in the back. And so he's kind of out of the way of this. But as long as no one faster comes around, they should be okay to, to fight it out a little bit. Or if Winemaster spins again, that might be a problem. And, they, and he gets caught up in this mess. I'm uncomfortable right now. <laughs> I don't think you've been comfortable for many portions of this True. race. Winemaster's about 12 seconds ahead of them, so if he spins, he'd have to deal with it. And and look who is back, David Washington. Yeah. And you and you said it as well, right? I mean, he, he, single lap speed, if he can put a lap together, David Washington faster than you, but you've been far more consistent. But he's uh, he's going to put a challenge to you here inside of three to go, so we're not... Don't talk back, just just run your lap and, and we'll watch the battle. Okay. That car is amazingly clean, by the way, and I think we need to give our hats off to, to Dylan, even though he may not be in the top 10, like, biggest mover on the track, and then he's kept the car clean, and now he's going to have to fight hard for position here. Here comes Washington. Of course, something else we have to keep in mind is at the end of this race, we have to award the XPM Underdog of the Race. The Underdog of the Race Award presented by Street Performance Motorsports, where we choose the driver to get a $5 bonus. XPM also going to donate five more dollars to Three Square Food Bank. Um, which is going to, in total, uh, provide more than 150 meals to families in need by the end of the race. So, uh, taking into consideration all uh, that has happened tonight, I'll start thinking, uh, and we'll uh, we'll discuss it and announce who gets that $5 bonus as well later this race. There's a lot of drivers who have overcome uh, a bunch of attrition in this race to try to get good results. This time by two laps to go from Montreal, first race here ever in the Real Super Race at IRAPS Winter Series. There is Matt Danson trying to close this one out with some traffic up the road. Um, Danson already at the end nearly. Latner 39, he'll be coming to the white flag. Really, what a what a good performance he's put on. We talked a lot about Free Notch's dominance at Mid-Ohio last year. And here, oh, well, they're fighting again. <laughs> but we talked a lot about Free Notch's dominance last year. And this is, this is good for Matt Danson. I think this is going to, you know, put a bit of a star next to him in terms of what driver to look out for the rest of the season. And if he races the cup season. Can't wait till we go to uh, another short track next week as we'll head to Iowa for round number five. And at that point, be able to reassess where we sit uh, at the halfway point in this championship. Oh, way sideways was Joe Bergey, the three car that we saw on the bumper. Uh, these drivers may just uh, take each other out here or go for a late race bump and run. Another bit of sideways there for the four of Burgi. Here comes Deweese. He'll make the pass now. The race leader dancing not far behind these cars. They are still on the lead lap, so they're going to have to do an entire additional lap around the racetrack. But for the moment, Deweese takes the advantage. He pulls away to the hairpin. Matt Danson, therefore, several quarters behind them, about a half a lap to go away from his second career RSR win. And again, what a what a good win this is. He proved himself on the ovals and he's proven himself here. He's he's a oh, contender Agnes all Phillip. season. Agnes Phillip just spun directly in front of your race leader, Danson. Only a few seconds removed from possibly being involved in that. So that's going to cost uh, maybe a spot for Philip as John Ellenberg closes in for 10th and 11th. But he said at last race in victory lane that he felt like he was a little bit discredited by not being put in that championship conversation. Became the third different race winner in three weeks when he won last week at Michigan International Speedway. He outqualified Andrew Farinage tonight, but the important part was that he ran a cleaner race. And he's already celebrating. Final trip down the casino straight through 13 and 14. Matt Danson going to go back to back in the Real Sim Race Seed IRAPS Winter Series and win at Montreal. Some 12 seconds behind, Michael Araya takes the checkered flag from the number two position and 
We got to wait out another 30 seconds for the rest of the cars to come across the start finish line as those leaders really showed some speed here tonight. Kamer finishing this race now off of the final set of corners. He'll come across the start finish line scored in position number three. It'll then be Joseph Tice who nearly got caught by Andrew Fridaj. You can see Tice, the red car. He'll come through turns number uh, 13 and 14 to take the checkered flag there in the Dr. Pepper Chevrolet finishing fourth. And Freenage almost stole a P4 in this race. Probably could have won it. Could have, should have, would have. There it is, checkered flag, Andrew Freenage in fifth. Guys, I think I did it. Almost at the end of the lap. Final couple of corners for position 14. Yes. Not bad. Um, Plus 12 from 26. And held off Washington enough for him to self-spin again. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was behind you a couple of times. <laughs> he, he caught you at least, what, two, three times? And, and then you just yeah. to protect the position and overdrove the car a little bit. You'll get 14th. He'll get 15th. This race will end uh, with nine cars on the lead lap as uh, everybody now to the checkered flag. And that's it on the McConey Setup Shop 108. What an afternoon of racing here from Montreal. I'm so thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am so thrilled. I know I told you last Wednesday, Evan, that it was going to be a top 10. I, I couldn't do that. But hey, 14th and uh, starting 27th, I think I, uh, think I did well. I didn't even get my car has no damage either. <laughs> it's a very nice looking car. It's very shiny compared to, say, uh, Joe Berge and Braxton DeWeese who were banging with each other, but it was, it's was it been a good, exciting first, race. First thing I said, I think, was this is a race where consistency is going to be far more important, and I don't think there's any battle that highlights that more uh, than the battle between Dylan and David there. Um, you know, the consistency versus the speed, but the mistakes, uh, I think, kind of highlights that. Let's take a look at your IRAS full race results. The Horizon Racing Team driver Matt Danson with his second straight win and possibly new championship leader. After round number four with Michael Arias second and Kyle Kamer third. We'll talk with all of them in just a moment. Joseph Tice and Andrew Fridaj, as mentioned, rounded out your top five. But the rest of the top ten include Kyle Trudell, Aaron Winemaster, Braxton DeWeese, Joe Burgi, and John Ellenberg. Looking back, Agno Phillip, you know, had a bit of a comeback drive a little bit after punting in the wall early on, gets 11th. Bobby Krug in that 51 gets 12th. Ross Cato, R. Dylan Coyle in 14th. David Washington, it was a rough night for him, but he comes home 15th. James Ross didn't mention once in 16th. Lushinsky in 17th. The two Maras next to each other, 18th and 19th. And the 43 of Sean Kelst in 20th. Continuing on through, Brian Chambliss uh, makes it to the end, and probably the majority of these drivers did not. So Dominic Howe, Liam Sheed, Michael Bozier, and Daniel Eberhardt through your top 25. We didn't really mention Dominic Howe's issues tonight, guys. We talked a lot about Danson, who was third in the points, Ferdinand, who was first. Dominic Howe was second in the championship, committed to tonight only seven points off of Ferdinand. That is basically gone with the B22 finish here tonight. You got Gary Weaver, Steve Soa, Dylan Jones, uh, Michael Kaczynski and Sam Nieto. It's a look top to bottom at uh, your IRAP's full race results. We'll take a quick opportunity to step aside. When we come back, we'll talk with your top finishers and get set for a short track showdown next week at Iowa. You're watching the 2021 Real Sim Racing IRAP's Winter Series on Race Spot TV.
and back live for the virtual circuit Jill Vilda for Race Spot TV's coverage of the 2021 Real Sim Racing IRAPS Winter Series continued with tonight's Maconi Setup Shop 108, where Matt Danson is in victory lane for a second straight week. Well, happy that you're back with us and welcome back into the Race Spot TV booth alongside of myself, Evan Pasoko. Happy to be joined by Jonathan Burke, our in race reporter uh, down on track, Dylan Coyle and our junior Conky Potsy jumping into the production booth with us as well. And let's go trackside right now and talk with the driver of the 05 machine and your race winner from Montreal, Matt Danson. Going to go back to back, get the job done tonight north of the border. Matt, congratulations on the win. First half of this race made it look like it was going to be a two-horse race. You and Andrew looked very even, but you dropped back a little bit ahead of pit stops, went for the undercut, took the race lead, and at that point, we thought that we were going to be in store for some great end of this race action, but at, at some sort of penalty took him out of this race, and you're able to relatively stroll from that point for win number two. Yeah, thanks. Um, I thought it was going to be a, a ding-dong battle as well, but... Um... Yeah, obviously, I don't know if it was speeding or or what what uh, what Drew's penalty was, but um, yeah, I just I couldn't do anything about him um, in that first uh, that first half. Like, obviously, you know, um, the start sort of compromised being on pole. I probably should have gone slower in, in quality because um, you know, obviously, if you're if you P two, if you can hang it around the outside in in, in that left hander, then you've got the prime position in in um, in turn two, and, and Drew used that perfectly was able to slip by and then I felt like I had really good pace um, but I was just a catch, like I was faster where it just didn't matter, you know, like I was always way faster in the middle of, of every corner or, uh, you know, things like that and, and if I wasn't tripping over him, <laughs> then I just was uh, just getting stuck and I tried to back up my, you know, my entries heaps to, uh, to get a good run, like, you know, out of that chicane towards the hairpin and things like that but, um, I don't know, you know, to Drew's credit, he just, he did awesomely and I think I sort of heated up my, um, my rear tyres a few too much, a few too many times, like locking up, just trying to, just trying not to run over him. Obviously that's the last thing I want to do, so, um, yeah, then I was able to do the undercut and once I had that lead, I, I think I was, I was pretty confident that I was going to be able to pull away. Of course, tell us about this track, right? Uh, we're, we're used to seeing a couple of different road course races when we run this winter series annually. It's your first trip, though, full time here in RSR, but a racetrack in which, you know, NASCAR hasn't actually run these cars in, in some 10 years, right? So it's not a, a combination that a lot of people come to mind with. And obviously, almost going into a track without much expectation as to how it drives. What were some of the key points that you had to focus on here to get this car around here fast? Um, yeah, I mean, I never. I think I've done one race on this track since I bought it um, total, and then. Um, but I, I've, I've, you know, raced it a gazillion times on like the F1, you know, sims and stuff like that. So, um, awesome track, love it. Um, especially even just to watch a race at. Um, as far as what I was focusing on, I mean, that that sort of that middle mid corner sort of exit is is so massive on so many of the corners because it's usually like a chicane that leads onto a reasonably long straight. Um, so if you can carry that cor that corner speed, and then um, you know hold on to your tyres as well, that seemed like a massive thing. So the fronts weren't really wearing, but just the rear end, uh, you know, you, you could very easily turn that into jelly, so or jello, I think you guys say. Um, so yeah, it's just focusing on that, I guess. Obviously, the race win at Michigan was big, but with the issues that happens to Andrew there late, he's able to recover to a good finish, but um, you get the, the most laps led extra bonus point by one lap more than he did, so that max points for you um, shows me unofficially a one-point lead in this championship through four weeks. Obviously, coming in against somebody like Andrew, who's been here on Monday nights for so many times um, and has, has found such success, right, as a two-time defending champion in this, to be the challenger, to be the new guy, and, and to obviously have confidence in, in what you bring to the table, but to have seen it now executed through four weeks and with a really good chance headed into Iowa next week as we close it on halfway in this championship to keep the pressure on and to maybe try to build on an advantage here in hopes of the championship. How would you assess how your first forte into real sim racing has been and, you know, how you've performed through these first four weeks? Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been loads of fun actually. And, and even just, um, 
you know, an honour to be part of it. Just the uh, the presentation, the, the organisation of the whole thing is um, is second to none. So that's uh, that's a credit to you guys. Obviously, racing against someone of, of Andrew's calibre is, um, you know, it's it's awesome. He, he's a he's a great driver. I've, I've raced against him before and in you know, other other things, but um, yeah, getting that chance to sort of go head to head and and he's the I mean, he, he's the man, right? He's the goat of RSR. So. Um, I, I've, I've done okay, uh, you know, like in the back of my mind um, is Richmond, you know, where I don't think I I ever really, um, you know, made a serious challenge. Like I was there or thereabouts, but I, I don't think it was ever on Andrew's radar through that whole race. So Michigan, yeah, that was that was cool and I felt like I had good speed there. Um, I think I need to focus on, you know, th there's going to be some like short tracks that come up and I, I need to make sure I'm try and get what I can there and then maximize on the road course and who knows what will happen at Talladega. So I think I've done okay. And a short track with Iowa next week. Uh, any sort of outlook going into that one or uh, you won't know until you kind of start the prep work in the practice? Yeah, um, I think yeah, you, you summed, summed up pretty well. I, I won't know until I get out there. Like I've never been great with the B car, uh, the Xfinity car. So, um, you know, that was, that was honestly like a, a concern of mine going in. Um, to the series at the start, so a track like Iowa, I think, will probably expose me if I'm if I'm off. Um, so I, yeah, I'll probably have to try and get some practice laps. Normally, I try not to overdo it with the practice, but I think for somewhere like Iowa, and I think we we go to Lucas Oil later, I think as well. Like those sorts of tracks, I'll need to make sure I get my uh, my reps in. We look forward to an excited one that time out. Until then, we'll let you get out of here, Matt. Well, we have you though. Anybody you want to say hi to? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, so, hi to the boys at Horizon Racing Team. Um, uh, who else? Gosh. Um, yeah, the girlfriend's blog, Vegan Food Melbourne on Instagram. Probably not relevant to America, but it still looks nice. Um, and that, oh, obviously, thanks to you guys again, just for putting everything on. Um, I've got to, got to go to work now, so I'll, uh, I'll chuck the, uh, the broadcast on, 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 on a screen and, and just sort of watch that while I work through the day. I'd love to get to that. Uh, Matt, we appreciate you being here and racing with us on Monday nights. Again, congrats on the win. Thanks, guys. Race winner tonight in the McConey setup shop at 108. Dancing back to back, winner at Michigan and now a winner at Montreal. We'll continue down the finish sheet of results. It's a P2 in this one for Michael Lariah, and he's standing by with Jonathan. Michael, you were running a solid P3, P4 early on in that race, and then with that penalty to Freenaj, you got promoted to P2. How, what was it like out there? Wow, that was uh, probably one of the slickest road courses I've, I've ever driven. Um, and and just, just the way the car was and the setup, it was really a huge challenge. But um, it it was a lot of fun though, I gotta say. And just, just being in the conversation uh, with Matt there, who I know is a really good road racer, and then Andrew, of course, is I'm pretty happy. Good points day for you as well. What's the the big picture outlook for you after this? And we do have another road course at Indy. Do you think you can put on a performance there as you did here? Yeah, I look at these road races as a, a way to just gain solid points. I feel like um, I'm definitely capable of running top fives at, at any road course that we go to. So I'm looking forward to Indy. Uh, as far as the rest of the the season I just gotta put together some more solid runs I know uh, Michigan I had the speed but I just didn't hit it on strategy and unfortunately I I needed a caution but a caution never came so I think moving forward if, if I have the speed I just gotta uh, maybe dial back on the aggressiveness on the strategy and just be a little bit more patient and, and gain more points that way and next week, we're back to normal turning lefts at Iowa. What do you expect from that track? We know you were a contender at Richmond, and it's a very similar racetrack. That's probably one of my uh, favorite tracks on the service. Uh, I love the fact that you can run multiple lines, especially in uh, three and four. I like how it's a worn out uh, circuit. It's all about managing your, your rear tires and just being smooth. So I look at that as another race where I can really capitalize. Anyone you want to say hi to or any sponsors to thank before we let you go, Michael? Uh, yeah, I got to thank 
Profile Machine Products for being on board the car. And uh, I also got to thank my teammates, uh, Joseph Tice and uh, Sam Nieto for putting in a, a lot of practice this week and just helping us overall get better at the road racing. All right, well, congrats on the P2. We look forward to seeing you next week at Iowa, and we look. hopefully you have a good week this week. All right, you as well. Thank you. That was P2, Michael Loire, and now I'm talking to the final person on our podium, P3, Kyle Kamer. Kyle, you had a very a quiet kind of by yourself race after those first 10 laps and you come home p3 what was it like for you out there yeah the sk sim racing uh ford mustang uh was all over the place uh it was a handful uh that combination of car and track was uh a great skill check for sure yeah we and then we mentioned the temperatures were hot it was really slick like how how loose was it how difficult was it for you in some of these corners my biggest problem was getting the car to slow down. Um, the, the track just felt really greasy under braking, and um, so you kept trying to use more brake, and then they'd lock up, and then you have to get off them. And um, so that was kind of my, I felt like the biggest challenge. Um, you know, drive off, you just, you know, baby the throttle. It wasn't, you know, any different than anywhere else, but uh, for me, like under braking was where the, the big struggle was. Yeah, we had several guys lock it up, a lot of sledding. Did you get the top five? Say, we saw you get a grill start and hold that top five position. Did you really think this was a good result? I couldn't hear uh, much of what you were saying there. Uh, we, I know we started back in the middle of the pack. We got pretty loose on our qualifying lap. Um, you know, the the five and the eighty eight were the class of the field. Uh, today we didn't have anything for them, uh, but I would have liked to start a little bit closer towards the front and see if uh, uh, you know me and Lariah could have had a little a little battle. That might have been fun. Yeah, apologies. Can you hear me right now? Okay. Ten four. All right. Yeah, I, that, that was kind of the question I was asking, so you answered it pretty pretty well. And what are you looking forward to uh, for Iowa next week? We're back to normal oval racing. Uh, just trying to finish, trying to finish the race. That's pretty much my goal in, in uh, all the short track ovals, is just try and finish, avoid the disasters. Thank you so much for talking to us. Congrats on the P3 and this great result, and hopefully we see you maybe back in the top five next week in Iowa. Thank you. But a big thanks, uh, as always, to our top three for chatting about Dan Sid, Michael Raya, and Kyle Kamer. And I do now have the updated championship standings uh, that have been officialized. And it is new championship leader, uh, Matt Danson, by one point over Andrew Ferdinand. Of course, the disaster of a night for Daniel Everhart takes him out of it. He's some 50 points out of this now. Down in 11th in the points. Michael Arias is in contention. You got Dominic Howe, Ross Cato, and then Michael Arias. Uh, three, four, five. Obviously, a big loss for Hal with the DNF in this one. Uh, after he was second in points, only seven points off into tonight. He leaves third in points, 26 off. But I think my takeaway, Jonathan, is Matt Danson and Andrew Friedhoff are going to have a juggernaut battle for these next six weeks. And I am not going to miss a Monday night. And I hope everybody tuning in at home doesn't as well, because this is going to be, I think, one of the best Winter Series title fights we've seen in a long time. No, and I, th I think Danson kind of proved himself here as he's going to be here to challenge Frenage and here to stay. And it's almost a two-horse race with how losing out big, Eberhardt losing out big. You know, the Mick Pack is still going to be exciting, but this two-horse race up front that it's developing, it's it's going to be the best it's been in a while. One road race down, one more to go later this year. Four races down, six still to go. That's it for us here tonight for the virtual circuit, Jill Villeneuve. We are back in one week's time, Monday, December the 21st, for round number five at the virtual Iowa Speedway. That race and every race of the 2021 Real Sim Racing IRAPS Winter Series can be found exclusively here on Racebot TV. So for Hugo 
Luis, our junior cocky party for Dylan Coyle, Jonathan Burke, and myself, Evan Pasoko. Thanks for tuning in, and congratulations to tonight's race winner and new championship leader, Matt Danson.